talk about mold progress. Um, what do you think is the likely future of mold progress and what kind of mold progress would you like to see? I would like to see us to continue the kind of moral progress that we have made, which is to be more universal in our ethical concerns, to include all human beings in uh, the idea that every human being and indeed every sentient creature is worthy of some moral consideration. So um, as I wrote in my book, The Expanding Circle, I think we have over human history pushed out the boundaries of human concern and I want us to continue to do that to the point where we include every sentient being. Um, I can't say whether that's likely. Um, it's obviously threatened by various developments, including just recently we've seen this uh, retreat to um, more nationalistic policies and more like America first or uh, you know whatever other country might be putting uh, their own interests first and uh, xenophobic reactions. So um, I don't know if that will continue, but that is certainly what I'd like to see continue. Okay. Um, what's your uh, view about uh, life, uh, how to measure the value of life unrealized um, compared to life, life realized? So like the person affecting view on mm -hmm. one hand and uh, the potential populations of people that could exist in the future. Uh, I, I don't think anyone really has a good answer to the, that question of um, whether you know, some people would say we ought to give equal weight to whatever lives exist or potentially could exist um, and that's one answer that at least I guess is a clear and consistent answer but um, many other people would say that they don't think that the life of the merely possible life of someone who may not exist at all ought to be given the same weight as the life of an actual living being and certainly I think we are attuned to respond to living beings actual beings rather than to merely possible ones. Um, but once you start to get into that, and once you start to say, well, I will give greater weight to actually existing beings or perhaps to beings who will exist independently of anything that I can do, which is different from beings who are merely possible depending on what I do, um, then it's very hard to say, you know, that there's any particular discount rate. There's no real reason for saying that, you know, you ought to give actual beings twice as much weight as um, merely possible beings or a you know, hundred times more weight. I mean, it's, it's a pretty arbitrary choice and I don't think we have any clear answer to that. Uh, so all of that suggests you might say, well, then why not just say that any beings who possibly could exist should count the same as any actual beings? Um, but as I say, that's uh, an answer that very many people are reluctant to make um, and is that just a kind of uh, intuition that we have that we've evolved to have that we should get beyond possibly possibly but i'm not really ready to commit myself to that view at this stage do you think there's an inherent cluelessness about these sorts of issues that we'll never be able to sort of insurmount or, or do you think there's specific directions in philosophy or science that we can take in order to be more sure about uncertainties? I think this particular area is one of, of deep uncertainty where people have very different views. We, certainly, you know, work is going on and um, people are trying to defend person affecting views and if somebody mounts a good defense of one, um, of a person affecting view, then I suppose that will be a reason for thinking that maybe that there, there is some basis for the answer that we ought to give priority to people who actually exist or um, certainly will exist. Uh, and in the absence of that, perhaps you might say, well, then we ought to go the other way. We ought to give equal weight to every uh, merely possible being. But um, I don't, at the moment, I don't see a way of getting beyond those options and uh, resolving the question one way or the other. Parfit brought up a thought experiment in um, his book about the degree of severity between three options, one of them being peace, the other one being 99% uh, of people uh, going ex like dying or 100% extinction. And he argues that most people say, well, obviously uh, the degree of difference between peace and 99% of people dying is, is uh, the worse. Uh, do you know, you, you, you're familiar? I'm familiar with the passage. I don't actually think he does take a view on what most people say. He, he's pretty clear that his own view is that the 
the bigger difference is between 99% dying and 100% dying because he then talks about the untold number of, of future lives that will be lost if 100% uh, die, whereas if 99% die, then that 1% will presumably regenerate and multiply and so on, so there will be more lives. So he's, what he's very clear is that he thinks that that's the bigger difference between the 99% and the 100% rather than between the, the 0 and the 99%. Um, and of course, you know, if you think that, then um, you are giving weight to merely possible beings, to beings who would not otherwise exist. Um, and I greatly admire Parfit's uh, philosophical uh, abilities to think through these issues. I think he was a, a real philosophical genius. So um, the fact that he says that has to you have to give you have to give that a lot of weight. And indeed, you can not just that he said it, but you can understand why he said it. Um, you can understand that the loss of incredibly large numbers of, of human lives um, can be seen as a, an immense tragedy and uh, a greater tragedy than the death of 7.3 billion people, if that's the 99%. Sure. Is there any sort of strategies for philosophical investigation or progress that you'd see as being valuable in being able to make more sense of whether this is correct or not, the correct assumption? Well, I think we have to really reflect on the assumptions that underpin the, the two different views here, um, the person affecting view and what you might call the total view, as Parfit referred to it. Um, uh, and we have to, you know, Parfit was sort of always looking for a coherent theory that could explain um, uh, in some way mesh with at least some of our important intuitions and be coherent and consistent. Um, uh, I don't think he ever really found it, although um, I think there's still some unpublished work that he left to be published. It will be interesting to see what's in that. Um, but uh, no, I, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not able to see. If, if I could see what we needed to do to clarify this, then I guess I would have to have a view about what is the right answer to this question. Um, and I don't I really find that, uh, you know, as you say, one of the most intractable philosophical issues that we have. You, you posted on a forum Parfit's sort of comments on like the like the last version of the reasons of purpose, purpose. I think it was the third version that was coming out. It was on, on what matters. Yes, on what matters. Yeah, it was yeah. volume three of so, uh, yes from the last uh, paragraphs of, of volume three of on what matters, which is only just being published now. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on his view on the overwhelming importance of the far future, as Nick Beckstead also put? Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is the same issue, right? The, the if our species survives, and you know, as Nick and maybe maybe Derek thought, if if it sort of can get through the next century or two, then the assumption is we will have got smarter, we will have learned better how to solve our problems, and perhaps we'll also have colonized uh, some other planets or something like that. So. Uh, the danger of the extinction of our species will be reduced because even if there were, for example, a nuclear war on this planet, there would be humans surviving on some other planet who could then eventually replenish this planet. Um, so uh, I can understand quite well why Parfit and others think that uh, the far future is overwhelmingly important and that it's important that way is uh, anything present. Uh, yeah, I think that's a, that is an understandable position. Um, it's not an easy position to actually act on, I think, given that we have face a lot of very pressing problems that we know we can make a difference to. And uh, it's not so clear what we can do that will um, preserve the far future or reduce the risk of extinction um, and therefore the loss of the far future. So that's why it's a difficult position to decide what we ought to do. But, but it, it makes sense. I can't deny that it makes good sense. Okay. Uh, one of the major sort of themes of this humanist conference that we're at is uncertainty. There's certainly a lot of uncertainty with regards to the long future. Yeah, yeah. How do we best sort of account for uncertainty? Not cluelessness, but uncertainty that we have some sort of measure of um, data about. Well, if we have some way of um, assessing the odds of various outcomes, um, then I don't think there's a big theoretical problem. I mean, well, we need 
two points. We need the probabilities of various outcomes and the values of those outcomes. And then what we're really interested in in deciding what to do is to act so as to maximize expected value. So uh, the value of the outcomes discounted by the uh, odds against achieving those outcomes. Um, now, uh, the problem really is where we are not able to estimate the probabilities where there's, um, you know, it's not just that there are certain things where we you know, can't exactly predict, but that we can't even get ballpark sort of figures of what the probabilities are. And of course, in some cases, it's also controversial what the values of the outcomes might be. But, um, but I, I, yeah, I mean, if, if we can't even talk about the odds of various outcomes, then um, I'm not sure what we can do. I suppose the simple answer is, well, we, we have to get some approximation of the odds of those various outcomes and act on the best approximations we can get. Um, that's not a very good answer, but maybe there isn't a better answer. Thank you. That is a good answer from my standpoint. I, well, talking about the future of um, philosophical progress in trying to make sense of uncertainty, do you think that there's things we can do or directions we can take in which we can get better at it? Uh, yeah, probably. I mean, I think what we can do is to try to uh, look at the situations where we're lacking the kind of information that we have about the odds we need and um, maybe find some ways of uh, making decisions under that kind of uncertainty that uh, represent still a better um, better prospects of, of maximizing expected value than simply randomly choosing one or the other. Okay. Um, what are you worrisome or, or pessimistic with, uh, with regard to the future about? Uh, climate change is the clear answer to that. Um, I'm very worried that we're, uh, have already done very serious damage to the climate of, of our planet, uh, that we're not stopping to emit the greenhouse gases that cause that damage, and that as things get worse, um, that will trigger more conflicts um, because you know, people will not be able to continue to survive in parts of the world where they're surviving now. Um, they will have to move. Um, other people won't want them to come to their country. Uh, and, you know, simply the world will become a less hospitable place for humans and for the other animals who've evolved in the kind of climate that we have had now for thousands of years. Um, so, so I think that this is a very difficult issue to resolve. It requires concerted collective action. It also requires um, politicians to act, and politicians are uh, always likely to want to appeal to the short-term self-interests of their electorates, um, and what they need to do is to appeal to long-term global interests. So it's a uniquely difficult problem for our species to solve, and uh, I'm not particularly optimistic that we're going to manage to do it. What do you then optimistic about with regard to the future? Well, if we put aside the problem of climate change, which is a sort of huge shadow ha ha uh, hanging over the things that I'm optimistic about, um, I am optimistic about progress in reducing extreme poverty. Uh, extreme poverty in the world has fallen quite remarkably um, over the last uh, 30, 50 years. Um, uh, the health of the people in general has improved. Uh, infant mortality or child mortality has fallen dramatically. Um, education has improved. Literacy has improved. Um, so there are many things that uh, we can be positive about. And, um, you know, clearly science and technology continue to make progress as well. Um, and a lot of that is very good. It helps us to feed ourselves. Um, so that's good. Uh, in general, there's been, despite the newspaper headlines, there's been a reduction in violence. Uh, the number of people who die violently at the hands of other human beings is uh, dramatically less now than it has been in any previous period of human history, as far as we know. So, you know, there are many things that it's good to be optimistic about, uh, that we can, we, we can be justified in being optimistic about. But, as I say, uh, climate change could cause us to go backwards on many of these issues. Do you think there's a, something akin to a moral arc in the universe? Do you think values could be reduced to real things in 
in the physical world, or do you think that they're somehow relative a little bit? Uh, neither. Um, I don't think uh, I, I'm. I don't support a naturalistic reduction of values. I think normative, uh, the normative realm is its own. Um, but on the other hand, that doesn't mean that values are relative. I think uh, values can be objective, but they can be objective normative truths, as I think there are objective mathematical truths. Um, and I don't think mathematical truths can be reduced to empirical claims. Um, so, uh, or, lo or truths of logic for that matter. Um, so I think there can be objective normative truths um, without them being reduced to uh, the kinds of objects that science can examine. Interesting. Okay, is there anything you've changed your mind about that you think is worth talking about? Uh, I have actually changed my mind on what I just said, um, you know, about objective truth in ethics. Uh, for much of my career, I would not have held that view. Um, I would have said that uh, when we make ethical judgments, we are universally prescribing what we are able to uh, accept um, uh, and you know, prescriptivists are not objectivists. They don't think that there are actual truths uh, about morality. On the other hand, I did for a long time look for a way in which reason could play a role in this, uh, in what we can, limiting what we can prescribe. Um, and eventually I did come to think that reason can play a role, but it involves abandoning the prescriptivist view of morality that I'd had since I was, uh, well, since I was a student at Oxford uh, working with R.M. Hare, who's the leading 20th century prescriptivist. Your talk um, uh, at the Humanist Conference was, um, sur sur oh, was it? I don't forget the title, sorry, Surviving the Trump Era? No, it was um, Public Ethics uh, in the in Trump, Trump era. Right, yeah. yes. Um, so, have you got anything like you can say about like a... Um, truth and the, the use of alternate truths in politics and that's it. Uh, well, I think it's very important that um, we maintain the idea that there is an objective truth, um, that uh, is, there, there is a, a reality, a view of the world that can be described and uh, that we not sink into a kind of uh, phony relativism where there's your truth and there's my truth. I don't think that... Uh, is the case, and I think we need to stand up for the idea of uh, of reason, of thinking calmly and clearly and rationally, and trying to get the facts straight in order to work out what we ought to be doing, what the best policies for our future are. Mm -hmm.